floor for questions from people on the floor. Uh, but uh, I think what I want to start with is this idea of art and the commodification of art. We have to be able to prove somehow that arts and culture has deliverables, which is sort of reminiscent, of course, of, of the back in the 1990s with neoliberalism. So when you talk about the importance of the arts, you started off by saying this is the industry and this is how much money it brings in. But isn't art, isn't there another reason for art and culture than just the deliverables? And are you not cutting off your nose to spite your face by focusing on the deliverables rather than saying it's just good for, for life? I'll, I'll kick that off as the, as the opening question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is it's 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 not a focus. It's a fact. So you're going to have to deal with it whether you like it or not. Then I'm saying, well, if you've got a fact that's good, <laughs> why not celebrate it? Okay. Then there are problems. There are huge problems. I mean, uh, there are very bad things that happen in creative industries. You have people like Berlusconi who just takes it over and uses it. You have hierarchies, you have internization, you know, people expected to work three years for nothing. There are lots of studies about, you know, bad hierarchical relations. It, that's a policy issue. Something is happening with, something is happening, what's the best you can do with it? That's, that's my attitude. So, is mass culture, is mass commercial aesthetic content, which is what we're talking about, an obstacle to the realization of cultural opportunity, or does it make it easier? I think it makes it easier. I think that, you know, when people, for example, let's take what, of all things, um, Canadian Tire is reconstructing itself as a high value added institution. They've realized that, you know, you can't sell it. People, even with quite medium income, do not go into a store these days and say, I want the cheapest. They say, I want it to look good. I want it to feel good. I want it to feel that like I'm a person who can pay for something that looks nice, that some human has sat and thought about. What does it feel like to sit on this instead of sitting on a block of wood? That's in, that's in Manitoba's history. I went and checked out when I spoke to the mayor's luncheon. Uh, where did the trees come from? And it's fascinating. Just go into the archives and check out. In 1905, the citizens of Winnipeg, all 1,732 of them, <coughs> voted to put two-thirds of a cent on the mill, and they handed the boulevard construction over to the Parks Department. Right? Why the Parks Department? Because they said, we want to be a city instead of a brothel. They thought the difference was the permanence of having trees. So they didn't want wooden boulevards, they wanted trees, they wanted to show they were decent, upstanding people. Now, 100 years later, where are we the benefits of that? You, we are now creating the emerald carpet of artists. And the people in 100 years' time will thank us for it and say, thank God I'm in a city where the people had the foresight. Well, if people could do it 100 years ago, when it was very difficult to pay for, and now this stream of income and this stream of willingness to pay for aesthetic content is coming, doesn't that make it easier, is what I would say. Hey, Tom, uh, I don't, I'm, I wrote about four pages specifically about this in preparation for tonight and I didn't talk about it, um, but I think that there's, there's different reasons. There's, there's, there is artistic or creative sector elements that are very, make a lot of money. Architecture is one. Um, digital media seems to be making a lot of money. But there's also uh, a lot of streams of art that need to be art for art's sake, is, if you will, R&D. But it's also things like um, Art City and Graffiti Gallery. And, and um, we had a, a, a seminar last uh, Friday, and we had Art City, Graffiti Gallery, Urban Indigenous Theater Company, and Art <coughs> talking about um, how art can transform lives, whether it's in mental health or in healthcare or in, in areas um, that may be socially repressed or, or financially um, depressed areas. And, and kids will come forward and work on art and it can transform their lives. The, those things are needed and, and policy needs to address that. And the question, 
was posed to the people who run those associations, and, and they said, what is your biggest challenge? And don't say money, because money is the biggest challenge, and we're just going to... What, so what's your second biggest challenge? The second biggest challenge was how the money is flowed. Um, the, the folks at Graffiti Gallery are very concerned about this because the money that goes to Graffiti Art Program doesn't come from the arts branch. It's not arts funding. It's funding for at-risk at youth. So you tell a youth that you're at risk. Well, I'm at risk. What am I at risk of, you know, spouting on and whatever, falling off this chair? Um, but if you tell a youth that you're at risk, they're going to believe that. But if you tell a kid you're an artist, they're going to believe that. So the policy has to be that places like Artbeat, who deals with mental illness, and Art City, who deals with art and families in West Broadway, and is transforming that neighborhood, by the way, um, and Graffiti Gallery, who uses hip-hop as a way to engage um, disenfranchised youth, you have to give them money to do art programming. That's a policy decision, and that's a very valid reason. And I sat through a session at the United Way a couple of years ago that talked about, well, how can we justify this money? Well, we can talk about the fact that one year in jail costs the system however many hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if we put $20,000 into a youth that's going to keep them out of jail for a year, what a great return on investment. And it's like, you can't do that. That doesn't work. You have to give money to a youth because a youth has value. So it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's about value and it's about, um, I, I listened to a woman who was talking about an island off the coast of Newfoundland and they've turned it in, it's an outport and they've used arts and culture or they're using arts and culture as a way to retain their community. And she said, value equals what matters. So the conversations that we have to have are what matters. So on one hand, jobs matter, economic impact matters, but so does art for aesthetic purposes, so does art for helping youth or somebody who's sick or in education. So it's, it's a question of what matters to us. And did you have anything to add? He's got an awesome job. Okay, great. Well, let's, well, to continue with that, let's talk about when art matters and the idea that that is subjective as well. I think it's really easy to convince the politicians uh, that they should be giving funding for uh, symphony for the folk festival for opera that makes sense but you have a woman who goes on the stage and collects menstrual blood and calls it an art project and suddenly you have Linden Woods suburbia sort of suburb hopefully no one is here from Linden Woods but anyway that uh, up in arms my tax dollars shouldn't go towards that and you have that dead bunny project which still burns how many years later I, so, I actually used the dead bunny reference in the notes today yeah uh, but, and that's why that's why it's from a political perspective, it's way easier to say, oh, this is a great uh, economic driver. This generates jobs, it generates wealth, and we just won't talk about the dead bunnies hanging from a tree. Or the, you know. um, so so it's, it's sort of cyclical, and I, I don't know whether it was the advent of the, the funding for cultural industries that started to drive the the idea of let's define it by jobs in the economy as opposed to the original altruistic reasons for funding the Canada Council for the Arts or the Manitoba Arts Council, which was access to art and you know Canadian art and make artists' lives better. That we need artists to have quality of life. Um, but somewhere it seeped in, and through the 90s you called it neoliberalism. That got in there, and it's 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 ingrained in how we talk about it. I'll just say, you know, I think that one of the things that art does is cause controversy and it causes conversation and it causes these discussions and it causes people to share opinions and, and whether or not it stays on the subject of art or goes into other things, that's, that's really, really important. We need people to be communicating. We need people to be sharing ideas and differences of opinion because that's where change happens. That's where excitement happens. And, and that's one of the best things about art is, is, is that it, it has that capability to do that. I mean, politics does the same thing, but I mean, you don't necessarily look at a tree and have a big debate about a tree. It's, it's part of nature and nature's wonderful. But then when, you, when people have these different opinions, it creates this whole new sense of, of, of connectivity in, in, in a community. And that's the other thing too, I think, is that one of the things that, that art does, regardless of 
of whether or not you have a, an opinion on whether or not something's valid is that it does build the opportunity. Like I mean, I, cause I, again, I think about it from a musical perspective, and I think about what happens what, what, when people come out to to our festival and the kind of community that's built there, and that's and that's something that's shared in in a way that doesn't seem to happen as much these days. People are sharing so much online. People share in a community that is so external from a, a real life experience. And when you can have a, a musical experience, when you can have a, a live theater experience, you're, you're doing that all together. And, and that creates a, a certain a common experience, that, that common, um, that, that, that you're just sort of sharing life. And I think that, that art is one of the few things that actually is able to do that now. I think it's quite easy to deal with that kind of argument. And the, and the, and the argument is what kind of place do you want to live in? And it's about vision. You, you, you can, if, you, if your political leaders don't have vision, it's not going to work. If your business leaders don't have vision, it's not going to work. If they have that vision, it works. Let, let's take Glenn Murray, you know. And the, the things that he did, as I understand, were at the time extremely controversial, extremely unpopular. That bridge was not respected if you go and look at the press at the time. It is now an icon of Winnipeg. Right? Go figure. So when somebody says, I don't want to waste money on this, you say, just have a historical memory. Just think back. And I'll tell you a second thing. I, was, I love what you said about the image of the prairies. Because one of the things that we can do, you know, not just politicians, is project a vision. And if you do it, politicians will pick up on it. And I remember when we set about changing the brand of London, we sat down and we were the first central government that London had had for 20 years, and we suddenly found it was a different place. So we said, okay, what kind of place is this? And we, we did a huge survey throughout Europe, and we found the image of London was it has um, people in funny costumes and smog. That, that was it, you know, heritage and weirdness. Okay, and, and accents, and accents, right? And a queen, a queen. Yeah. So he said, no, we want London to have the image of being the creative centre of the English-speaking world. And in ten years we did it. And I remember we sat in on the Olympic negotiations, and London was an outlier. And France, Paris was up there, right? And I remember it so well. You even now you get this, this radio programme about the persuaders where it's, it's, he waxes lyrical, and, and it's so funny when you've sat down and you somebody waxing lyrical about something you were there, and you're like, I don't like that at all. What happens was the French came in and they said, um, come, to, come to Paris and experience French culture. What? We said, come to London and experience your own culture. And the image was a world in one city. Now there's a lot of thinking that has to be done in Winnipeg. I am astonished at how ghettoized this city is. It, I don't, that's the one thing, I came to this city, you know, and uh, one of the things I feel when people talk about brand is to me it's like when you adopt a kid and the kid says, do you love me? You say, well, we chose you. Oh, well, I chose Winnipeg. There's a lot to come here for. But people don't boast about the fact that we host one of the, West, the most Western Francophone communities in, in That's a thing to boast about, that we are a centre for Aboriginal art. That's a thing to boast about, that we are the historic meeting point of the peoples of North America. That's a thing to boast about. So the brand of, of Winnipeg is like there for the making. If you think about what you are and project it on the world scale and realise how attractive that is, I think people will put up with any amount of experimentation because you say that's part of the mix that makes us great. It's our diversity. It's the variety. It's actually the things that you don't like and the fact that we fight and we argue about them that makes it such a great place to be in. So I mean, if you have that leadership and one is not ashamed but proud, it's it's easy to deal with, is my feeling. Right, so you're talking about sort of just a transition the way we view it and, and yeah, yeah. shipping over no, paradigm. No. Yeah, sure, shipping over time. So let's talk, um, yeah, that yeah, deserves a lot for sure. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the new digital platforms, the effect that that then also has in the arts community. Uh, let me tell you, newspapers understand that <laughs> 150%. We have a generation that's grown up recognizing they get their music for free. They get their TV for free. They are consistently side-tracking any of the paywalls that the best people have set up. 
And so how do we get, how do we change that paradigm to recognize that if you take it for free, then you, you end up ripping somebody off as a result? Or do we just, I mean, just what's the answer for this new digital revolution? Well, um, I'm going to refer to one of Alan's colleagues at, at Nesta in the UK, um, and what they're calling for is a unified European IP um, that everybody who goes on the internet is tracked. It's really not very difficult to figure out who's downloading what, and it's not very difficult to track where it goes. Um, part of the problem in the music industry was the record companies put their head in the sand and said this internet thing is going to go away. Um, and that's where the file sharing came out and, and nobody, nobody monetized it. I sat through a, a workshop where, where a film guy came in at a music industry conference and the, the film industry guy came in and said, from LA, and he's a big hot shot, and he said, I feel it's totally for you people in the music industry because you guys are getting ripped off. It's never going to happen in the film world because the files are too big. <laughs> It's <laughs> like, seriously, dude? Shake your heads. Um, but we have the capacity, the technological capacity to track it, to figure it out, to make it happen. Um, it's going to require a level of collaboration on an international level, and it's going to require the leveling of a number of institutions. If you look at the music industry alone, when you've got performing rights, neighboring rights, um, what are all the different rights? There's about five different rights to a piece of music that are administered, the, the, the fund money coming back in is administered by different uh, royalty collection agencies and every country has their own version of them and they share, neighboring rights sort of share with neighboring rights but they don't share with the, the others. Um, so there, there's a lot of people that have to come together, but it is doable. And at a certain point, the artists are going to get starved. I think the story was Farrell, who had uh, 250,000 downloads in a week, made something like $20,000, which is ludicrous. So the artists are not being compensated. So something has to change. The newspaper model has to change. I was lucky enough to sit in on a session with Peter Mansbridge and he talked about the change of technology in, in television or the news broadcast and it's astounding, you know, that four times as many people watch the national on their phones as they do on TV yeah. and, and don't pay for it. Yeah, uh, and they don't pay for and, and, and that is the head of the mentality. Did you want to add anything on just one thing that was missing, because and I think the Folk Festival is very important, incredibly important here. As an economist, one of the things I track is what people spend their money on. And there's a guy called Will Page, who is the chief economist, actually the only economist, which means you get to be the chief, at the Performing Rights Society in the UK. And he tracks royalty, so he knows his stuff. And he's done something on what he calls the wallet effect. And the wallet effect goes like this. People can download for next to nothing. But their budget for music stays constant. What do they do? They spend it on live. And live everywhere is going up. People will now spend more to go to a live performance at the Dome in Greenwich than they will, they will pay to go to New York. It's incredible. And because people, what's driving this is people basically getting better and better off. Real incomes are rising. And there's incredible poverty, but there's also incredible wealth. And what's happening is people are now discriminating aesthetically, and they value live performance, seeing in, being in the audience with the artist, more than they value getting a download. And they will pay for it. They will pay for it. They will discriminate. That means local is actually incredibly important. I mean, let's take Milan and fashion. People think Milan and fashion just happen because Italians have an innate sense of design. No, it's because they have an innate, they have, you know, a, a unity of rural and urban. That's why. First of all, the aesthetic sense transmits between the different communities. But second, there is a value chain in Milan in the hinterlands that goes all the way from the guy who makes first class thread from New Wall on the mountain, all the way through the weavers, the spinners, the dyers, right the way up so that I as a fashion can get the finest aesthetically uh, produced cloth at the local level. So it's organizing your local. So I think the new, the new arts economy is live and local. And, 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 and we should not forget that. Great. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I think that's true. I mean, and you see that now because 
In the past 10 years, we've seen a huge growth in music festivals. I mean, um, our artistic director has been with our organization for a decade now. And 10 years ago, there were 100 music festivals in North America. There are now 1,000. And that's a sign that, that, something's going on. that something's going on. And I mean, I think the barriers to entry to create a music festival is, is not particularly difficult. You just need some money to do it. And there's lots of people with deep pockets, and there's lots of communities that are recognizing the value of the, uh, the live music sector. In fact, there is a new organization that has just started this year called uh, Music Canada Live. And it is because we have to value the live performance. We have to value what is, what is happening for the venues, for the promoters, for the artists. And we have to make sure that we are continuing to tell policymakers that this is a very important part of the sector, especially as we see the uh, recorded music sector dying. Can I just make one last comment? I would, I would liken what's going on in the digital revolution to uh, the industrial revolution or the agricultural revolution, except that those revolutions happened over generations. This one's happening over two weeks. Um, but in each one of those revolutions, when, when the industrial revolution, when the agricultural revolution happened, people lost their jobs. When the industrial revolution, people lost their jobs and found new ones and moved to cities. This is going on. There is going to be an upheaval. There is going to be change. And, and we're going to have to figure out where the new models come from, and there's going to have to be streams of revenue generated. So, like you're saying with the revenue, with, with the live. Sure, sure. I'd sum it up with what, how do we get to be like Tennessee? How did Tennessee get to be like Tennessee? They make something you can't make anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Weather? Well, <laughs> sorry.